Okay, welcome everybody to this new DASI seminar. Today it's my great, great pleasure to introduce Professor Frank Hatter, and I apologize in advance if my pronunciation is not correct. Frank Hatter is full professor at the University of Freiburg in Germany. He holds a PhD from the University of British Columbia, for which he received the 20, the 2010 Canadian Artificial Intelligence Association Doctoral Dissertation Award for the best thesis in AI in Canada. He also won several best paper awards and prizes in international machine learning competitions. He is a fellow of ELIS and the European Association for Artificial Intelligence, director of the ELIS unit Freiburg, and the recipient of three ERC grants. Frank is known for his research on automated machine learning, AutoML, including neural architecture search, efficient hyperparameter optimization, and meta learning. Today, he will talk about AutoML, highlighting that it can be efficient, and arguing for an emphasis on multi-objective AutoML to also account for the multiple dimensions of trustworthiness, such as algorithmic fairness, robustness, and uncertainty calibration. I want to thank again Professor Hatter for very kindly accepting our invitation, and whenever you're ready, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, thanks for this invitation um, to give a talk in this series. And um, yeah, also um, for, for the nice introduction and, and thanks everybody for being here. So today I would like to speak about deep learning 2.0 and about AI methods that build AI methods and improve other AI methods. So AI that builds AI, AI that improves AI, that, that definitely sounds a bit futuristic. And I asked uh, Dali too for an illustration of this concept and I quite like what it came up with here. Um, but so you might ask yourself to what end do we actually want to build and approve AI? And my answer to that is to be more trustworthy. So that could encompass a lot of different objectives um, such as being more performant, more fair, more calibrated in terms of the predictions of the uncertainty, more energy efficient, more robust, and in general, just to be more aligned with the human user's values. So um, that's going to be sort of the, the red thread um, throughout this talk. And um, that brings me to the outline. So I want, I want to start with an overview of what I mean by deep learning 2.0. Um, and then I'll do a deep dive on actually really learning an entire AI algorithm using AI. Um, so the first is more on, on improving AI systems, and the second is actually more about building one from scratch. Um, and then I'll give an outlook. All right. So let's dive right in with Deep Learning 2.0. No? So to explain what I mean with Deep Learning 2.0, let me start by discussing why deep learning succeeded in the first place. So before deep learning, the traditional practice in machine learning was that the domain expert here um, engineers features for the data at hand, and then one can use a traditional machine learning um, method for uh, the featureized data, such as XGBoost. Now, this feature engineer was often a slow and painful process involving a lot of trial and error, and deep learning, in contrast, can learn these features from the raw data here and can therefore completely bypass this manual feature engineering stage. And that saves manual labor and yields better results by an end-to-end -end joint optimization of the features and the classifier that's learned on top of these features. Now, this success um, of deep learning is, is really an example of the fact that throughout the history of AI, manually created um, algorithms and manually create, created components have been replaced with better performing automatically generated ones. And um, my proposal for deep learning 2.0 is to repeat the same success on the meta level. Now, deep learning has removed the need for this manual feature engineering here, but it has really replaced it with a manual architecture and hyperparameter engineering by now not a domain expert, but now by a deep learning expert. And like with feature engineering, this is actually a tedious trial and error process. And to go from this, what I call deep learning 1.0 to deep learning 2.0, we again bypass this manual step 
yielding the same advantages that deep learning brought over traditional machine learning in the first place. And so deep learning 2.0 can be realized by having an AutoML component. AutoML is the main thing that I work on um, that performs the meta level learning and optimization on top of a traditional base level deep learning system. But this is not the complete picture of deep learning 2.0 because in practice, we also often care about important additional objectives that deep learning 1.0 by default doesn't actually take into account, such as fairness, robustness, model calibration, et cetera. And that's why my, my vision for deep learning 2.0 includes that the domain expert actually enters the picture again and uh, in order to specify well both the data and the objectives that they actually care about for a particular application. For example, policymakers could specify the right algorithmic fairness criteria in a specific application. And then what is now a multi-objective AutoML component can find instantiations of this base level deep learning system that yield the Pareto front of non-dominated solutions. And this then actually allows the domain expert to exactly optimize for their objectives um, by design. So the deep learning doesn't optimize some objective that is completely at odds with what the um, domain expert actually wants to do, but this multi-objective component directly optimizes the objectives that the domain expert specifies. Now, I expect that deep learning 2.0 will have great impact because it's a paradigm changing technology that democratizes deep learning and your deep learning 2.0 projects will be um, actually possible without a deep learning expert. And, and it directly optimizes for the user's objectives, um, thereby yielding this trustworthy AI by design. And because of that, I, I think that deep learning 2.0 will be even more pervasive than deep learning 1.0 with a huge impact on the already billion dollar market. Now, finally, I believe that uh, deep learning 2.0 should also help deep learning experts and work hand in hand with them. So while the deep learning expert is not absolutely necessary in order to get something, um, if one is available, then the system should actually accept optional guidance by such experts to yield even better results faster. All right, so, so having covered this, this vision of deep learning 2.0, in the rest of the talk, I'd like to discuss several of the parts of deep learning 2.0 that are already in place and, and where you can actually really um, make further improvements um, in order to get there. And, and so a, a lot of these um, pieces here are about this AutoML part. How you actually do you do this? How do you do this multi-objective optimization? Um, some obvious parts of, of AutoML are sort of hyperparameter optimization. Every deep learning algorithm has a lot of hyperparameters. And um, how do you set them? If, if you can't even do that automatically, then well, it's definitely not hands-free. Um, then a bit more complex is a neural architecture um, search. So what types of, of architectures will actually yield good performance? Uh, what will yield low latency? What which will actually which are more fair uh, architectures, etc. Um, so that's a multi-objective AutoML. This is a core component here. How do you treat this? These multiple objectives. Um, briefly, I want to touch on some AutoML systems that that have this. A really nice interface where the user really just says, "Well, this is my data. These are my objectives. Go." Rather than these are my um, this is my data. This is my type of algorithm. These are the types of hyperparameters that you might want to configure. So that that's more for for experts, um, really novice users, and um, don't typically have uh, this this machine learning pipeline, and they just want some sort of system that that would um, work for them and that they can iterate on. And then um, in the end. Uh, actually, the meta learning of entirely new algorithms is, is also part of this um, deep learning 2.0 framework. All right, let's start with hyperparameter optimization. So, hyperparameter optimization is um, everywhere, and there, there's a lot of um, high profile users of it. For example, AlphaGo, actually, before um, the final match against Lee Sedol, um, DeepMind actually did tune 10 hyperparameters um, with Bayesian optimization, and that improved the win rate from 50% to 65%. And, and that tuned configuration actually in the end um, played against Lisa Dahl. Um, if you look at fine tuning foundation models, there's a, this host of different types of hyperparameters 
that uh, you could optimize. And this is just in the fine tuning stage. There is other hyperparameters for the pre-training pre stage, et cetera. So there, there's just far too many choices in order to do this uh, really uh, optimally in a manual um, fashion. Um, now, one way of, of solving this um, hyperparameter optimization is as a black box optimization, um, where you treat this um, base level deep learning system as um, this black box, and you specify this um, lambda, the hyperparameters, and measure the f of lambda, the um, validation performance of a, a trained system with these hyperparameters. And then on the um, this meta level optimization just becomes a black box optimization, and you don't need all the rest. This black box optimization you could then do your favorite black box optimizer, random search evolutionary methods that you mentioned um, some people in the audience are working on, reinforcement learning, or uh, what's my favorite um, these days is Bayesian optimization because it, it's just the most sample efficient of, of all of these because this black box function is actually expensive. So Bayesian optimization in a nutshell, um, if you have this um, hyperparameters here, I can only um, visualize one hyperparameter, but this could be multidimensional and f of lambda here. Uh, let's say we have evaluated this already for three hyperparameter settings. Then what you do is fit a probabilistic surrogate that predicts the performance for unseen hyperparameter settings. And um, let's say here we want to maximize f of lambda. Then you want to trade off exploration and exploitation. For example, here there would be a point that's high predicted uncertainty and relatively high predicted mean. So you go and sample there and see, ah, actually uh, my prediction was here, but this is actually the real function is down here. So then you locally change your uh, predictive distribution and you iterate and, and you keep on sort of um, choosing good trade-offs of exploration and exploitation and uh, relatively quickly actually find uh, the optimum of um, these functions. And there's also um, convergence guarantees under certain um, assumptions, of course, on the function. Now, um, this, this is sort of the, the standard picture of black box optimization, but black box optimization for actual deep learning, that by itself is actually just far too slow. And, and so we need to, even with Bayesian optimization, if, if you need 100 function evaluations um, you know, for GPT-3, for example, which costs you um, $5 million to train once, you don't want to do that 100 times. And, and even if you're, you know, you're the standard computer vision researcher and your model trains two days, you can't do that a hundred times. So you need to do this faster. Um, and there's there's a whole lot of different methods out there for speeding up hyperparameter optimization. And I'm really trying to push more on this front. So one is a multi-fidelity optimization where you gain speed ups by using cheap proxies of this expensive black box function. And you can gain cheap proxies by, for example, uh, for iterative machine learning algorithms, such as stochastic gradient descent, you could reduce the number of epochs. So, so that's sort of trivial. Uh, for images, you could reduce the resolution. Uh, you could reduce the number of classes in your training data, the number of data points, the width of your network, the depth of your network, all kinds of ways in which you can make your function evaluations faster. Of course, you're going to get worse results, but that's not the point. The point is figuring out which are the good hyperparameters and uh, learning sort of extrapolation behavior when you then actually make it bigger, which ones will be the best hyperparameters for the black box function without really ever evaluating the black box function. So um, maybe actually getting to the point of being able to do hyperparameter optimization for the cost of two function evaluations or even one. Um, meta learning is another way of, of getting there. So there we can learn to transfer across tasks and we can also learn to extrapolate learning curves. So uh, learning to extrapolate learning curves is, is quite similar to reducing the epochs, uh, because if you reduce the epochs and, and, and you already figure out which one is a good one, then you can already predict where is this learning curve going to go. So for example, if you have this initial learning curve, it will probably continue learning like this. And if you have one like that, it's likely to go like this. And, and you can actually learn this um, using um, all kinds of different probabilistic um, models. Another way to speed up hyperparameter optimization is to integrate human expert priors um, to really bridge the gap between AutoML and the domain expert that actually tends to like to do things themselves. So if you give a Bayesian optimization method, um, which is already one of the more sample efficient black box optimizers to a, a 
a domain expert that has a function evaluation budget of maybe 10 function evaluations of five, then, and, and it goes and samples somewhere where it has high uncertainty, it doesn't know anything to start with. So of course it needs to sort of sample in order to learn the space. And it samples sort of at the range, at the outer ranges of, of your hyperparameter settings and the domain expert thinks, of, how could you sample that? That's never going to work. I could have told you that. Then they're not going to use a method again. Um, rather, we should really start where the domain expert thinks that the optimum likely lives and then integrate that prior knowledge that the expert has over this is probably where the optimum lies um, into the optimization. And that can actually get us um, um, easily in order of magnitude speed up. And you can also combine this with a multi-fidelity optimization. And we did that in a recent NeurIPS paper. Um, this method here is called prior band. Um, it's a mix of um, hyperband, including prior information. And um, if you've heard about hyperband, that this is uh, one of the very simple multi-fidelity optimization methods. Um, this prior band is actually a, a, a lot faster than hyperband and can really get to the point of, you know, if you have 10 function evaluations, it can do a lot in terms of your optimization there. And already sort of for a single function evaluation, it, it's, it's um, as good as hyperband, maybe after five or so. All right. So... Um, so much for hyperparameter optimization. There's there's a lot of tools there, and we're trying to push the um, boundary a lot so that um, yeah maybe future versions of GPT etc. will actually use um, tuned hyperparameters rather than sort of uh, half hazard um, hyperparameters chosen by hand. Um, but of course, not only for GPT, but for any type of uh, foundation model pre-training or even just your your standard model that that you train on on some domain where there exists no foundation model. All right, so the, the second part here is neural architecture search. Um, the motivation there is clearly the choice of architectures matters. Uh, here we have a plot of uh, architectures over the years and um, the performance rises, of course. Um, here uh, um, on the right, it, it shows that there's there's also other objectives. So there's the, the size of the networks, there's latency of the networks, there's accuracy of the networks, and really it's this multi-objective space where you want to actually be Pareto optimal. Um, and um, well, let's go a little bit more in detail for neural architecture search. So that's about finding the neural architecture such that when you use this in order to do your deep learning, the deep learning actually works well with this. The representations that you learn um, can be learned well using this neural architecture. And so it's measured by this um, validation error of the architecture with its trained weights. And then you can write this as this bi-level optimization problem where on the outer level, you optimize the architecture. So you find the architecture, the best one, A and capital, uh, and, um, calligraphic A. Um, with respect to the validation performance, this architecture should do well if you use weights that are optimized for this architecture. Um, what does this mean? This means, well, they're optimized for this architecture with respect to training performance, because that, that's what you use for training your weights. You use the um, standard uh, training loss, cross entropy loss typically. And so it's this bi-level optimization problem. And this has famously been tackled by reinforcement learning in, in a paper that sort of um, for many people gave AutoML its name. Um, AutoML has been there since 2012, easy, uh, maybe already before, but um, in the mainstream really, uh, it came with this paper in 2017, where Google had this project that they called AutoML and then all kinds of um, bloggers, etc., cetera, uh, latched onto it. And, and AutoML so for a while became equivalent with neural architecture search. And in particular, this is really slow neural architecture search that evaluated 12,800 architectures in order to find something that that's sort of uh, close to state of the art um, for something that costs $60,000 for a small data set like CIFA 10. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm trying to argue no AutoML doesn't have to be so slow. There is really fast method for doing AutoML. Um, and in particular for neural architecture search, this paper here um, was uh, quite early. And, and since then, there's actually over 2,000 papers on neural architecture search. So it's a, we're not getting bored in this community. Um, one of the, the uh, breakthroughs in this field was um, the DARTS algorithm, which is this def differentiable architecture search. So there, 
Uh, that works as follows. You relax this discrete problem here. So um, maybe I should explain that first. So in neural architecture search, it's, it's all about finding the right types of operations on, on your data. So these nodes in this graph here uh, represent the latent representations. Um, so maybe your original data and then your, your process data after a particular layer. And the question marks here are all about what is the operation that you have on this edge going from here to there. And you could have different operations, for example, like, I don't know, three by three convolution, five by five convolution, a self-attention, um, et cetera. And um, the, the, of course, there's, there's an exponential number of possibilities, and that's why, why NAS is hard. Um, and why you could tackle it is just as a hyperparameter optimization or black box optimization, but you can also tackle it by a differentiable method by uh, this following trick where actually for on each of these edges, you just put all of the different operations and give each of these a weight. So if you have this operator that is, um, where is it down here? So operator O and O, you give each of these a weight alpha. Um, so this alpha sub O, that's a, the weight for this operator O. And then you get a combined operator that is sort of this convex combination of the different operators. So a little bit like you, you take the resulting latent representation that you get from a three by three convolution, the resulting one you get from a five by five convolution, the resulting one you get from a self-attention, multiply each of them with their weight, sum them up, and that's your new latent representation. Um, you can of course do that. And then, well, these weights, they're continuous weights. Though, so there you can then actually do gradient descent in order to um, solve this bi-level optimization problem. And, and practically this is often done by doing one update step on these alphas, on these weights of each of these different um, architectural choices, and then an update step on the actual weights of the, the, the parameters of the neural network. And that then, uh, results in some local optimum where some of these edges are weighted much more highly than other edges. And then in the end, you um, discretize in order to get the optimal architecture. And well, um, this is just one of the approaches in the in the community. It, it has a lot of um, issues still in terms of robustness. For example, this final discretization step that, that can really uh, give you very bad performance. You can find a architectures like, like these that, that we showed in a um, paper at iClear, I think three years ago or so, um, we showed various failure modes where it only picks skip connections um, because, um, well, with skip connections, your network trains fast and it was just this local minimum that, that Dart uh, runs into. So it, there, there's a lot of robustness issues uh, around this differentiable architecture search, but it's still one of the approaches that, you know, if the community cracks differentiable architecture search to make that robust, then basically you get a search for the architectures at more or less the same cost as just optimizing the weights of your architecture. So because maybe it's twice because you do one update step in the architectural space and one in the weight space, but, but it's really sort of at, the, at double the cost, you get an optimized architecture for your new data set. Um, if, if uh, the robustness um, issues are, are dealt with. Other ways of um, um, doing NAS in an efficient way is, is of course using all the extensions that I already talked about in terms of HPO and applying those to NAS. So you can get speed ups by multi-fidelity optimization, meta learning, priors of our architectures, et cetera, that just really directly carries over. And also there, this is, um, there's not that much work despite these 2000 papers on actually sort of this holy grail of discovering entirely novel architectures. So, so one criticism I have of the NAS community is, is that a lot of people focus on these really small um, architectural spaces that really just give you a little epsilon over existing architectures. But despite 2000 papers on neural architecture search, transformers have not been found by neural architecture search, but have been found uh, manually. And, and I would like to change that in the future. But um, in order to tackle that, we really need to look at uh, much more expressive architectural spaces. And so for example, these hierarchical search spaces, um, they are super expressive. They're, there's like 10 to a thousand possible architectures in these search spaces. And um, for example, transformers, um, 
you can actually write as, as a hierarchical space. So um, like even the picture in the original transformer paper, you have this piece here is this piece and this this small piece is this piece. So each of these you blow up on, on another level of the hierarchy. And um, if, if this is just an instantiation of the architecture in a hierarchical space, then um, this hierarchical space um, might also include other possible architectures that, that could be uh, very strong. So um, yeah, we were also looking um, in, into that. Um, and maybe one final thing about neural architecture search. This is really heavily used already in, in, in industry. So in, in case you're, you're wondering where is AutoML actually used in industry, it's used pretty much everywhere uh, where you have um, a lot of different devices. So Samsung has hundreds of different devices and different architectures are actually have different latencies on different hardware. And nobody in their right mind would want to manually optimize your architecture for each of your hundred devices, but you really want to do this um, automatically. Bosch has a lot of sensors, so it optimizes the neural architectures for these sensor, sensors. Google has different um, devices like, I don't know, a Pixel phone or a TPU. And, and you don't want to use the same type of architectures on, on these different devices, um, but, but you really want to use energy efficient um, architectures while still getting uh, good performance on the different devices. So there is, there's a lot of multi-objective optimization actually um, happening in neural architecture search in practice. All right, multi-objective optimization um, is, is another big piece um, to look at all of these different um, objectives, um, including fairness, and that's where I would like to um, give an example next. Um, combining what I talked about for neural architecture search and for hyperparameter optimization and applying that to actually finding um, better solutions for, in this particular case, face recognition. So face recognition um, systems are known to exhibit bias um, with respect to different social democrat uh, demographic dimensions like gender and like race. So for example, lighter males are typically very well recognized, whereas uh, darker females are recognized uh, the worst. And this, this goes across different um, practical systems by different companies. And um, this is of course a problem because, well, face recognition is used, um, especially in the US by law enforcement agencies for sensitive applications, like identifying subjects, tracking down missing people, biometric security, et cetera. And the question is, how can we improve it? The, the community has already looked at all kinds of different pre-processing methods and different training procedures, different post-processing methods, and, but they have actually not really solved the problem. And in this particular paper here, we asked the question whether deep learning 2.0 can actually help. And um, yeah, so we, we um, in, in this type of um, fairness research, you really need to be contextualized very well. So, and, and, um, so we need to quantify, um, say very clearly what we did. So we, we only looked at the cell of eight um, face recognition data set with a protected attributes gender and this particular fairness metric rank disparity. And, and so there we, we did a study of how, how important are architectures for this, how important are hyperparameters for this, and basically evaluated all kinds of different architectures and hyperparameters and, and found that, well, there, there's a lot of Pareto dominated um, solutions out there and just a few, uh, Pareto optimal ones. And then we, we built a architectural space around um, some of the best ones and, and actually optimized further and, and found something that basically Pareto um, dominates all the existing um, procedures. And so the, the result was we, we could actually find architectures um, or combinations of architectures and hyperparameters that are more fair and more accurate than any of the previous um, fairness mitigation algorithms for this particular problem. And, and this also extended to actually some different protected attributes and to some different data sets. All right. Good. Um, so much for AutoML, um, multi-objective AutoML. Um, next, sort of the, this brief overview of AutoML systems, where you try to optimize this entire data science pipeline. So for example, it's like it learn has all these different classifiers, like 15 different classifiers. Each of these with different hyperparameters, then it has 13 different feature preprocessors, four data preprocessors, each of these with um, subordinate hyperparameters. So in total, something like 110 hyperparameters in the space. And you know, data scientists need to choose the, the right types of methods with the type uh, right hyperparameters. And 
um, that, um, yeah, we, we realized that. And based on that, we actually came up with the first AutoML systems for tabular data, um, first AutoWeka, and then um, 2015, this AutoWeka Learn approach that bases on scikit-learn and um, um, a new version this year. So, so in a nutshell, what these AutoML systems do, they have this Bayesian optimization that I talked about before, actually also multi-fidelity Bayesian optimization, et cetera. And then on top of that, they put meta-learning to learn across different data sets and learn like, like off what data sets like this, this type of uh, pipeline has worked well in the past. So I don't need to start from scratch, but I have knowledge that I can start the, um, the search from. And in the end, when I've evaluated all kinds of different auto uh, or machine learning pipelines, then I can actually use that in order to build an ensemble of them. Um, and this Autoist to Learn actually won the first and second AutoML challenges um, in which it, it actually did also better than all teams of human experts. Um, so there was one, one phase in the competition where there were 130 teams of human experts. They had a couple of months time to uh, tackle some data sets and Autoist could learn, we let run for a day and, and it actually did better than uh, these 130 um, teams of human experts. And, and this is our um, um, open source um, a tool that, that has the, the largest number of monthly downloads. Uh, so something like 20,000. Um, yeah, AutoWeka also just um, got this Test of Time Award at KDD um, 2023. Um, and, and there's another tool by um, James Bergstra um, that got a, a follow up um, test of time award at ICML. So it really goes to show that AutoML is, is, is really being recognized now as, as something important with two test of time awards in one year. Um, another uh, very exciting um, tool is AutoGluon that, that is really, really strong in engineering and, and fully embraces um, assembling. And I'll, I'll discuss in, in a little bit uh, this top PFN approach. Um, and also mention briefly the CAFE method later on for tabular data. All right, um, that brings me to the last part of the talk on meta-learning entire algorithms. So um, that's also an important part of AutoML. You know, if you can entire, uh, learn entire algorithms, that's, uh, you can actually do a lot of optimization. For example, learn entire uh, matrix multiplication algorithms or learn an entire SGD optimizer. So there's this learned line optimizer that may or may not be better than other variants of, of SGD. I think the verdict is still out, but it's uh, definitely some large language models are being trained with this now. Um, people are quite excited about it. And there's also for tabular data, we have this uh, TAPFN. So that's a learned tabular classification algorithm. And, and that's what I want to talk about in this um, deep dive here in the second part of the talk. All right, um, let's dive right in. So. I'll uh, first talk about the premises and a preview of the results for this particular deep dive. Um, so tabular data, um, I already talked a little bit about it in terms of the AutoML systems, but tabular data is, is really the most common type of data. It's sort of this think Excel data, um, in rows and columns, so machine learning one-on-one, you train a random forest on tabular data. Um, and, and this is the most common type of data, but deep learning did not traditionally excel on it. Um, rather, it's SVMs, random forests, um, XGBoost, et cetera, AutoIS can learn, AutoGluon, and so on. Um, neural networks, on the other hand, they're actually really good for large amounts of data. Um, they're slow to train, they're prone to overfitting on small data sets. But in practice, actually, you have a lot of these small data sets, sort of by definition, you have many more small data sets than these um, very few big ones. Uh, the community, especially in, in you know, um, structured data, um, talks a lot about these big ones like ImageNet, et cetera. But in practice, um, in domains like biology, medicine, climate research, and so on, you have a lot of these small data sets, maybe 100 data points, maybe 1,000 data points, but not a million. You, you never have a million in these domains. But you still want to do something for them. So that, that's a setup. And um, what we do for that is we introduce this top PFN method, which uh, you can kind of see as a foundation model for tabular data. Um, it's very GPT-like. Um, it's a transformer that's pre-trained to do tabular classification. And you can frame this as, as this next word prediction task where you see x1, y1, x2, y2, and then xn, yn, xn plus one, question mark. What's the next word? Well, it says yn plus one. You want a probability distribution for that. 
So to be more precise, um, it's not a sequence, but it's it's actually a set. Um, we don't care whether the x1, y1 is actually x1, y1, or it's, whether it's x2, y2. Um, we want to be invariant to that. And to be even more precise, we want this probability distribution for yn plus one. And um, the way we do this is this top of n, that's going to be a neural network. It's going to be a transformer, very much like GPT. And it's going to have some parameters, theta, and or weights. And this here is really just going to be a single forward pass, just like with GPT. Um, you pass in this data set, you do forward pass through the transformer, out comes the probability distribution for the yn plus one. And well, um, you just, just need to optimize these weights here to do that well um, on average across data sets. And then the question is uh, which data sets? And there, there are not a lot of data sets for, for, so for GPT. Uh, OpenAI just crawled the internet and got all kinds of text. There are not that many high quality training data sets for tabular data, um, which is actually why we synthetically generated them. So we generated millions of data sets um, with x, y, um, y, y, x, i, y, i pairs, um, and then just optimized the um, standard uh, cross entropy loss um, in order to do, um, in order to really look at the cross entropy loss of this these predictions here with respect to the true y n plus one with SGD just very very straightforward and. The end result of that is actually, it's amazing. It, it's uh, 10,000 times faster than auto -ISK learn because it's just a forward pass. And it nevertheless actually performs better than auto -ISK learn So it's, it's really a, a phase transition in, in tabular data. And it's also this very different approach to algorithm design where we, we don't actually code this algorithm anymore. We, we learn a transformer, it does this somehow. Somehow in the weights it encodes an algorithm that you can apply to new data sets. And this algorithm is fully learned. We, we just say you should work well on these types of data sets. So we, we create a prior that we can sample millions of data sets from. And then for these types of data sets, it will work well because transformers are awesome and SGD just finds uh, good solutions and it will reduce the cross entropy loss and thereby actually learn a tabular classification algorithm that just lives in the weights of a transformer. So it, it, it still blows my mind when I think about it. Um, and it received a lot of attention. We got a best paper award at this NeurIPS workshop on tabular representation learning, and I tweeted about it, and that sort of had a million views. Um, there was a lot of the fight of tabular, like class, old fashioned classification methods, trees versus uh, neural networks. But um, it's, yeah, it, it could be potentially very impactful. All right, let's go into a little bit of detail here. Um, what is the, the basis for this? How, how do we do this? So it's these PFNs. Um, there was actually a previous paper in which we showed that transformers can approximate Bayesian inference. Um, and that goes as follows. So um, you have a prior over functions. For example, in Gaussian processes, you have a prior over functions. And then we make some observations, and we want to get a posterior of functions. And that is uh, intractable to compute exactly. Um, but well, we only want the posterior predictive distribution. We only want, for one particular point, we want to get a distribution for the y. That's still intractable, but it's, it's at least a bit a bit simpler. Um, uh, but but typically it's, it's intractable to compute. So you need MCMC or variational inference in, in order to do this um, in most cases, um, other than for Gaussian process, pretty much in, in every other case. And and we came up with this um, different approach for um, actually approximating this posterior predictive distribution with a neural network. And this works for every um, function where we can actually sample from this prior. So this, this prior here, we need to be able to sample these functions. And that's all we need to be able to do. So the way we do it is we sample um, functions from this prior. And then for each of these, um, we sample points from the function, and we call some of them train and some of them test. And we do that again and again and again. And it, we sample different amounts of points from these different amounts of uh, different functions. And we do this, I don't know, maybe 10 million times. So really a lot, um, because transformers like a lot of data. And then we just learn this PFN that predicts from the blue points 
predict the orange points. And once we have done that, we can actually, on actual data, just feed in blue points. And for the orange point, say, well, for this x here, where is the y? And put that into our forward pass, and it will just give us a probability distribution for um, where that lies. And, and that is what tabular um, classification, or in this case here, actually regression, needs to solve. And we have so, so we meta learned to approximate Bayesian inference purely by being able to draw samples from our prior and then doing supervised learning and nothing else. And so no complicated MCMC variational inference, no waiting for weeks for your sampler to converge, but it's just a forward pass. And, and this stage here of learning this PFN, that actually also takes you know, less than a day on, on a GPU, a single GPU. Um, and, and so this can predict posteriors that are arbitrary, arbitrarily close to the ground truth. So here we have a, a Gaussian process where we know the ground truth. And um, there's a green curve and a blue curve. And if you look closely, then the blue curve here is slightly different from the green curve. And the uncertainty estimate here is slightly different. But it's really, you, you've got to look hard in order to even see the difference. And, um, and this is for something where we have the, the, posterior, the true posterior, but we can also do this for Bayesian neural networks, for example. So if you, um, there the prior is just, yeah, you draw weights from um, each of your neural networks and the posterior predictive distribution would then just be the Bayesian neural network. Um, and there, um, we get like 10,000 speed up, 10,000 fold speed ups over MCMC for doing this Bayesian inference. And you can also do crazy things that you can't even do with MCMC, where our prior is not just a fixed architecture, but we, our prior says, well, it could be this architecture could be generating the data or this architecture or this architecture. And then we basically integrate over which architectures could have caused our data and which weights could have caused this data. And so we could basically do something like a Bayesian neural architecture search um, for which you would really need reversible jump MCMC, what is, would be too complicated to be practical. Um, and, and so that, that this is PFNs. Um, if you can sample from the prior, then you can compute this posterior um, approximately in, in a forward pass. Um, and it's only limited in, you know, this, this transformer is quadratic in the number of data points. So if you have a million data points, it, it, this doesn't make sense. Um, if you have a thousand data points, it's perfectly fine. And um, in TAPFN, um, that's a follow-up paper, really all we did is define a prior over what my tabular data sets look like. And then we integrated principles from causality and, um, yeah, just sample these uh, structural causal models. Um, so we sampled and initialized this causal graph, um, sampled edges in this causal graph, sampled where in this causal graph would be y, where would be x, etc., cetera, and um, sampled some weights and some um, activation functions and so on. And the inputs to this are these noise variables, epsilon one, epsilon two. And then, so, so this here is basically sampling the function this is what the function looks like. And then we sample points from that function. So, um, and we do that by actually sampling the noise values and propagating them through the function and then actually get sort of this x1, x2, and y, x1, x2, y, x, x2, y. And if we want to do classification, we threshold it and say, well, that's a one, that's a zero. And so here we sampled one function and we sampled three data points from this function. And of course, in practice, we sampled millions of functions. And from each of these functions, we sample maybe a, th a thousand data points and call some of them train, some of them test. And um, we have one more thing in this prior is namely a, a prior for simplicity. We want to have more functions th that are simple and less functions that are complex. So we can sample structural causal models that have latents and so on. There's all kinds of stuff that there is a common cause that I don't know and what this is possible, but it's maybe less likely than some relatively simple relationships. So um, this gives us a prior for simple explanations of the data. And then um, we sample from this and the generated data sets here, the synthetic data sets, they actually look quite similar to, to real data sets. And basically um, in the nutshell, 
So we sample millions of these data sets and learn um, from um, one subset of them, uh, of the data points to predict uh, the Y value of the others. And, and if we can do that for millions of data points, uh, data sets in a, in a forward past, then we can do it for a new data set. And so the relation to this Bayesian supervised learning was this, this prior of functions has these latents, and these latents are which structural causal model, which graph structure, which weights, which activation functions, et cetera. And so basically your posterior is given some data, you say, what could be the structural causal models that cause this data? Use these and an integral over all of these to make predictions for the other data points that I don't know the Y value for. So you, you integrate over possible structural causal models. And, and some of them that are unlikely under the given data, they, they just get um, pretty much zero weight and the more likely ones get, get high weight. And, and you train this with enough data that the transformer can't possibly remember these millions of um, possible structural causal models that you have used, but it just needs to generalize. And uh, the qualitative results is that you get really nice, smooth, and well-calibrated predictions that um, you, you might not get for small data sets um, with neural networks typically. And it's super simple in practice. So you don't need this fancy AutoML um, thing that's also maybe quite slow with Bayesian optimization running and whatnot. No, it's just a forward pass. So you feed in your data, it's a forward pass, and you make predictions. And, and so because of that, it's takes like 0.1 seconds on a GPU. So like a 36,000 full speed up um, over Autodesk Learn 2. Um, here we have Rock AUC um, over um, an average over 87 different data sets. And, and it just dominates um, all the other approaches. Not on every data set, but on average. So there, there are still data sets where it's not quite the best. And there's a lot of limitations that we're, we're working on um, resolving, like we, we were limited to a thousand data points and features and classes. We haven't looked at categorical features um, in the prior yet in, in this particular published work, missing values, uninformative features, et cetera. And, and so these are the things we're currently working on and uh, we were close to having them all solved and then hopefully write the next big paper. Um, all right, so in summary, uh, this TAPFN computes Posterior Bayesian inference for a given prior. Um, in our prior, we put elements of causality and simplicity. And so basically, yeah, tells you for this particular data, these types of causal models would be likely, and let's make predictions with these. But it skips the point. It doesn't tell you which causal models they are. It just integrates over them. And it gives you some state-of-the-art performance for small tabular data sets. And, and it really could give rise to this new way of writing algorithms where you just state the data that you want to be good at and then say, find me an algorithm that works for that. And it, it's still a, a very different type of programming. All right, so um, the outlook, sorry, a little late, but uh, let me go quickly through this. So we want to fix the remaining limitations. There's a lot of different research questions. How does this actually work? Um, also, we want to actually output the causal structures and, and posteriors over what's the probability that X causes Y and so on. So that one could work on that. Um, we want to work on, not in the top of N land, but in general, um, there, there's a lot of questions, of course, how do foundation models in AutoML relate? Um, there's foundation models for AutoML, like there's this former work and there's this cafe work um, from my lab where we actually use GPT-4 for tabular data to engineer features automatically. So we read the data set description, we read the feature names, et cetera. And then we use GPT-4 to actually write code that generates new features. So, um, and then we, we actually execute this code and, and run um, cross-validation, see does this improve? And if so, then we put the feature in and, and we tell GPT, well, this didn't improve, this improved, and it's an iterative cycle. So rather than doing this um, in a slow cycle where you propose thousands and thousands of different possible features. It just predicts like very complex features right away and that, that actually really improve performance. So it's, it's quite cute. Um, and yeah, uh, lot language models are pretty powerful. Um, and, and this will of course only get better when, when GPT even gets better. Um, there's also AutoML for foundation models. So we want to optimize the choices for the training process. So that, that's really this very 
um, making HPO, et cetera, really cheap by, yeah, like for neural architecture search, we, we have a particular way of, of using weight entanglement to make it more robust. We do, we have work, starting work on multi-objective gradient-based neural architecture search. We want to exploit scaling laws um, to predict um, this is what is going to be if you invest a hundred times more compute. And also we want to look at, you know, are you, what's, what's your activation statistics? What's your gradient statistics, et cetera. There's all of this um, information that is not typically looked at in black box optimization, but the information is available. And if the training run costs you a couple of million dollars, yes, you do look at that. And we want to look at that in, in our um, automated methods as well. And then there is this big playground that is AutoML for fine tuning. So there, uh, fine tuning is actually cheap. You can get away with all kinds of black box optimization, even um, evolutionary methods and so on would totally work. Um, and there's a lot of multi-objective problems, um, aligning with human values, robustness, truthfulness, lawfulness, um, et cetera. So um, I, I definitely encourage a lot more work on that. And maybe as a final question, a call to arms, trustworthy AI is, is key. Um, AI is currently progressing at this incredible pace and, and AI systems will really govern an ever increasing part of our lives. And I think we really need to ensure that we can trust these systems. So, so if you can, if you can make your students work on, on interesting stuff, like you know, maybe we, we need more work on trustworthy AI, especially in, in the EU um, to, to really push, push this work. With that, let me end. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we talked about Deep Learning 2.0, expert guided automated deep learning for the objectives at hand. Um, that gives you trustworthy AI by design, by really optimizing the user's objectives. Um, there are breakthrough results already for Deep Learning 2.0, and it doesn't have to be expensive. I, I hope I convinced you of that. So with that, thank you. Well, Press. thank you very much, Frank, for your very, very interesting talk. And now it's time uh, for questions, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Carlos Peláez González, please go ahead whenever you want. Uh, hello, Frank. Um, I'm very grateful for your great presentation. So thank you very much. I would like to uh, first, uh, you, are you hearing me? Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, how how do you think you can mix the auto machine learning task uh, with the trustworthy and uh, specifically with the transparency transparency because if you are learning this architecture hyperparameters etc cetera, etc cetera, in an automatic way and the model is bigger bigger the model can grow in 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 very different dimensions so how how can you improved the transparency of the models? A, a very good questions. And, and I would give two answers to that. The first one is transparency of the final product, the final model that's being learned. And the second one is trans, trans, um, transparency of how in, how in the world did you get to that model? Um, maybe the second one first. So, so that's really importance of your hyperparameters, which, which hyperparameters give you better performance. So, so we, we fit this Bayesian optimization model. We actually have a probabilistic model that tells us how good will the result be if we set these hyperparameters, if we set this architecture, et cetera. And, and you can use this model in order to actually um, give a lot of um, information about, well, if I had used these other hyperparameters, I would get uh, this much worse performance, et cetera. Um, and, and you you should in an AutoML system also you know tell the user you know I have this preliminary information and based on that now I'm going to do this and based on that now I'm going to do this and this so so that's an important part being um, interpretable in terms of how well um, like how how does the optimization actually um, work and and we have a, a bunch of previous works on that. Um, and actually, my previous postdoc, Marius Lindau, who was with me five years in Freiburg, he is now in Hannover, and he has an ERC grant on this very topic on um, explainable AutoML. So explaining the AutoML process, um, explaining the final model. Well, there you can actually use any type of explainability tool that you couldn't explain uh, that that you could use for um, um, a, a standard model that hasn't come from AutoML. But you can also actually, with um, Deep Learning 2.0, you could 
say, well, I'm only interested in these types of models that are transparent, uh, where I call maybe transparency, um, I, I want a linear model, then you just, then then this um, this base level model here is only linear models, or you only have decision stumps or whatever. Um, so if you can quantify transparency, then you can optimize for it. Um, and, and and you could actually say, well, I have this pipeline of of coming up with a with a solution and then running a post hoc transparency um, evaluation on it. And if if that gives me a quantification of how transparent my final result is, we can measure it. Then we can optimize it, and we can give you a Pareto front of you can get this performance for this transparency, etc. And and I, I think there, there there are a lot of questions of how do you actually exactly measure transparency and how do you trade this off, um, and and. I, I would love to see more more work in that because once we have that, we can optimize for it. Thank you. So I see limit, limiting the the model type, so you can uh, kind of set the transparency of the of the model, and then you you only have to train over that. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now it's turn for Isaac whenever you want. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for your talk. I really, really enjoyed it. And, and actually, from the very beginning, you gave me already a lot of food for thought. You know, I was like thinking, what? what? <laughs> and just at the very beginning, when you start uh, saying that, why AI to build AI? And your mm -hmm. answer was something like to make it more trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And that, for me, that was really, really a very fun start. Like, oh, wow, that's that's a lot of food, uh, um, food for thought, right? And then I understood why you mean, uh, why you said that, right? Because you... You're talking about deep learning 2.0 as multi-objective, right? And looking for mm -hmm. that fairness and looking for that robustness, right? And and I guess what Carlos was saying before is the idea of interpretability should be in the equation, right? To make it really uh, trustworthy. But apart from that, actually, for me, when I think of uh, deep learning 2.0, I would have expected you talking about not only more robust, but also more general, let's say, more general purpose, right? And... Um, and because people are using a lot of deep learning for many things, not one type, but many mm -hmm. of them, and the more like generality, foundational models, and then you touch upon at the end of, of the talk. Um, but yeah, I, it's more of, of a comment rather than a, a question for you. It's more like, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. That's a good way to, uh, the future of deep learning should be on making it more trustworthy, uh, but at the same time, also more general at some point, and maybe the, the combination of them would be two, three point zero <laughs> i don't know um just looking yeah, for I mean, the name it, it's a very good question and you know the 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 term deep learning 2.0 etc it, it it predates chat gpt etc and, and actually it's, it's an interesting question what like how does chat gpt relate to this and and you you could actually say basically it's an instantiation of deep learning 2.0 Right, because you have this multi-objective component. It's not quite multi-objective. It's this fine-tuning uh, reinforcement learning from human feedback. So it's a there is a deep learning 1.0 system for sure. It's just next word prediction. That that's clearly just base level deep deep, um, deep learning, just cross entropy loss. But that's in inherently very biased, whatnot, and and you want to um, make it non-biased, and and that is done by well specifying the objectives with a domain expert and um, the reinforcement learning from human expert the human is the domain expert and and they specify they're actually in the loop there to to guide the process um at that point it's sort of only optimizing for that and 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 actually if, if you look at the papers uh, of may i just did like they did millions and millions of of um updates um for this and they they did something like 50,000 updates for this and if you do too many updates then performance goes away and so then they stopped before it came too aligned um, to human experts. And, and so it, it's really not quite touching the Pareto um, optimization. It, it optimizes once this way and then once this way. And then before you go too far, you stop because you, you actually also go back there. And, and so I, I think there's a lot uh, to be tackled there. But I, I think, you know, it, it's a different way than, than having this, um, you know, more HPO and NAS um, perspective, but um, attacks a similar problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And and being more general, of course, uh, it would be nice to have the system that that is also super general. And um, 
And another way of, of talking about this, you, you can have uh, foundation models here that are super generic, and then you can do multi-objective optimization of these by fine tuning, et cetera, and it's quite cheap. That's what I touched about uh, very briefly at the end. Um, sorry, uh, Daniel. Okay, do you hear me? Okay, Fran, first, thank you a lot for your interesting talk. It's, it's very nice to see the perspective of improvement, the deep learning for O2ML and all that. But curiously, when we all are considering the trustworthy AI, but the thing with that is sometimes they blow my mind, you proposal of the tab PFN. And actually, when you, okay, okay, we can get a lot better results than the previous model, using a transformer pre-training. Okay, it's very nice to obtain that kind of result, but it's in contradiction with the interpretability. Because when you have a lot of model pre-trained, maybe it's not, it's, for instance, sometimes you, you want an explainable model for the company and, and it's, not, it's not easy to sell that this type of model or, is explainable for them, for an expert. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it's very, uh, it, 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 it's a very good question. Um, it, it's it's a question people ask a lot. Um, and, and there's multiple answers to it, actually. So one answer is, well, people tend to be perfectly happy to um, use XGBoost. Um, because, well, XGBoost, it's a tree-based method. You can kind of think about what it does, or it's, trees are very interpretable. But if you actually look at the uh, predictive uh, uh, distributions of, of XGBoost, it's, they, there's just no interpretability. It's just all over the map um, because it's thousands of these big trees um, average. They, there's no way that this is actually really interpretable. But, it, but the underlying mechanism is kind of simple to follow, and people like that. Um, TAPFN really turns things around. It says, what should be the data sets that it should be good at. If you expect linear models, just give me a prior that predicts, you know, that creates data sets of linear relationships and TAPFN will be a linear model and just a transformer that predicts a linear function. Um, and, and it is mathematically uh, very clearly defined what it does. It, it builds your posterior over your prior. So it, it, just does the same thing that MCMC would do with this prior. It just does it in a forward pass rather than um, after a week of sampling. But I, I completely agree. It's it's a completely different beast, and and it it will take a lot of time for for people to to come to pass with this. Um, one other thing that that is really cute in terms of interpretability um, for TAPFN is you can get now interpretability measures over how important is each data point? So that would, um, you wouldn't be able to do that really with, with standard techniques other than, you know, re rerunning your whole algorithm or your AutoML system or, or whatever with one data point being taken out. Here you can just, the, you just do a forward pass and then you back, backward pass and say, how important was this data point? And you just directly see outliers in your data, et cetera, or, or see data points that, that really drive the predictive model and, and yeah, so it's a, it's a different beast in terms of um, what you can get. And then of course you can do SHAP analyses and so on. And, and you can do them really fast because the prediction takes you um, um, very short amounts of time. But yeah, um, pros and cons in terms of interpretability, I, I do agree. Okay, thank you. Um, Paco. Uh, thanks. Uh, continuously with the discussion. Uh, last week I was in a conference and system and cybernetic conference and i had an interesting discussion with some people about this topic the interpretability and explainability some people uh, I, we, I, I had a, a talk i was discussing about uh, three aspects uh, responsible artificial intelligence according we have the the future i act and the regulation a safety is fundamental the robots nets and the moni monitoring the the, the 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 behavior of the of the model, particularly in any deep learning model, and trustworthiness. 
Uh, really, trustworthy artificial intelligence include a lot of requirements. Of, of course, robustness uh, is inside. Really, there is a, a clear connection. Uh, really, uh, responsibility, uh, a responsible and a safety uh, lead us to trustworthiness. And we were discussing that probably in the future, it will be impossible to explain and to have a complete interpretability and explainability. It's impossible when we are discussing with deep learning. But the most important is the governance and the safety, to guarantee the safety. Probably in the future, we must accept that we can explain until a um, le level. And really, we are discussing now about uh, uh, communication and transparency instead of explainability in the regulation. It's very important in some levels for some application, people must know that they are discussing, they are connected with a machine, uh, is the, the communication and the transparency, but it will be not impossible to explain why the algorithm take decision, but it will be fundamental the safety and to guarantee, uh, and of course, that, that we have no bad decision. And another aspect very important is the quality of the data because with the quality of the data, we guarantee the fairness and the correct decision. Then this is a complete discussion because it's true that we paid a lot of attention to explainability. Even now, we are trying to explain why uh, we take decision, but in the future, probably we must have said that we have only a limit, a threshold of explainability. And in some cases, the threshold is reduced and it will be fundamental the safety of the algorithms. It's a reflection that we must pay more and more attention, particularly in the case of the uh, aid to generate aid, the fundamental will be the robustness of the, of the, of the future models. It's a reflection. I don't know what is your opinion of that, because it's probably we discuss more and more about an impossible uh, explainability with a complex learning model with millions of parameters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would have a couple of points. So, so I, I think one one point that I only went went over very briefly is, is this cafe work. I, I think that that would work quite well in this respect, right? Because you use an LLM, something super complex, in order to write one line of code that generates a new feature. It actually also writes explanations for this feature. Why would this feature actually be useful? Um, and then, you know, the, the human expert can actually check this feature. Does this feature make sense? If so, then I actually really expect, uh, accept this code into my pipeline. Um, so I, I think this, this is a, a, a nice, more traditional um, approach of using um, complex LLMs to actually then in the end, you just have a tabular prediction model, whichever one you, you trust, and, and you just have another feature that um, you also manually inspected this one line of code and, and you trust that. Um, that is, um, but but I do agree that in the end, you know, that this probably will not be the, the final uh, solution, but uh, other methods that, that do this uh, then in an integrated fashion um, will probably be more, more efficient and, and then uh, the governance becomes much more, um, much trickier. Um, yeah, so so one thing that I really like in particular about TAPFN is that it's a training on synthetic data. So it, it's really this, this structural causal model. You know exactly the data that it trains on. It's, uh, you specify the prior. Um, you 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 say what are the probabilities that the structural causal model should look like this or like this or like this? There is no dirty data we train on. Um, in contrast to you know the um, all of the bias data that the ChatGPT is trained on, that there you need to worry about okay how how do you um, how how do you um, get rid of this this bias? We never have this bias uh, because well we we have the bias that the user is set. This is what the data. Um, this is what the type of predictions should look like. And and I think I'm, I'm not aware of, and maybe uh, if, if you do know any, but please let me know, I'm not aware of any approaches that can actually really get you um, 
probabilistic predictions over what could be structural causal models that cause my data, like about a really integrating causality in a probabilistic framework that that, that makes any any sort of uh, predictions that are close to a state of the art, and and that is something that you know um, causality is 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 rarely talked about in regular in regulation, but I think. Um, if we can actually reason causally about the data, that would be something that aids so much in terms of transparency in order to and, and inter interpretability, et cetera. And of course, then, you know, do an integral over all possible causal relationships that, that then becomes mind boggling again, and nobody can really reason about it. But, but we could, for example, say, well, what are the main possibilities of, of causal models? How likely, given this data, is it that X causes Y, et cetera? Um, I, I think that I, I haven't seen a lot of work there, and it, it would be great to, um, yeah, and it, I, I, I like PAPFN for that reason, that it can do that, but um, it, it would be great to see other work along those lines. And 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 I must say, for, for TAPFN, I haven't really put there the two together, the first part of the talk where optimize optimized for all kinds of different objectives and, and TAPFN, where it just learned this function in terms of, um, you know, in, in, um, in terms of good cross entropy loss. But but we have uh, started looking at, um, at causal interpretations and at, um, um, for example, uh, looking at fairness under a TAPFN framework. We, we've, have initial ideas of, for example, doing um, yeah, doing causal reasoning with a um, basically counterfactually fair um, approaches, um, which which are otherwise just not um, efficient these days. But um, yeah, maybe I leave it there to to make some chance for other questions. But uh, I, I I do realize that this is a minefield, but at the same time we need to navigate it somehow. And and at least you know openly talk about the objectives and and think about how to measure the objectives because once we can do that then we can optimize for them. Thank you. Thanks. So we have time for a last question, Sergio. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for your talk. I really enjoyed it uh, quite a lot. Uh, it was uh, really impressive for how you. Uh, presented the deep learning 2.0 as a global umbrella into which uh, I mean uh, includes all the challenge uh, currently from my point of view in in AI and stating them as a, a multi-objective uh, problem or multi-objective challenge as I also mentioned um, from that point of view I also realized that I should, uh, talk more frequently about research to Paco and less about the bureaucracy and uh, and paperwork, <laughs> by the way, uh, because my question was uh, pretty uh, close to his in, in terms of how to um, rank all these objectives, because sometimes it, it is well known in multi-objective of optimization that uh, whenever you are trying to deal with a pretty large number and also challenging number of uh, of uh, objectives, the problem uh, I mean becomes more and more complex. And so, from that point of view, you I think uh, already uh, answered one of my questions. But uh, another one was related to the very uh, last reflection that you were dealing with. That is uh, also a challenge in in multi-objective optimization. That is related to uh, performance indicators in terms of how to measure the performance of the multi-objective approach that you are trying to deal with. Um, regardless of the, the the problem you 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 are facing, so my question will be: uh, Is it really cross entropy loss? So what do you are? Uh, I mean, the best choice in that regard, or do you think we we should face this uh, in some other way? Um. So so for the first part of the question, I, I um. There was more remark, but still, I would say what well, the 
I, I mentioned these uh, many different um, objectives here. And, and of course, it, these aren't even all of the trustworthiness dimensions. And, and yeah, it, it's tough to get them all. Um, and there's trade-offs. So if, if you put all of them as objectives into the system, and well, probably in most cases, one, one should in the future have all of them in, in the system, then, then the Pareto front optimization will get harder. Um, but that's probably fine. That's on the technical side. But then even when, when we find this Pareto front in the six dimensional space, then what do we do with the domain expert? Uh, they were like you can use this or this or this or this or this it, it, then we really need preference elicitation to really understand how do they rank them what's more important for them and and so that that's another dimension that i totally just haven't tackled at all um for the second part of the question i, I didn't fully understand it so so cross entropy I, I think cross entropy is totally not what we should be optimizing but that is just what uh, what the internal deep learning 1.0 optimizes and and in this part here, we we sort of constrain this to to optimize more for that. Um, okay. And yeah, the the internal optimization of the base level deep learning it, it's just very much bound to cross entropy laws. It's just it, everything is sort of fine tuned for that, and it's sort of this ecosystem has evolved for optimizers that do well in cross entropy and architectures that do well on cross entropy and so on and. And it's sort of this local minimum that I think would be very hard to change the objective in the base level. Um, th th there are initial approaches for thinking about multi-objective optimization on the base level, but it's, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, the point is how to uh, globally measure, uh, I mean, the, the conflicting objectives uh, that could be, for instance, planability, fairness, and all these uh, challenges. And, and how to uh, rank them um, in, in terms of uh, performance indicator that helps you to choose uh, the best or the optimal solution in terms of the spiritual front or yeah. should be, I mean, uh, because uh, another, as, I, as you mentioned, an, another very important point is uh, which point of the Pareto front is, is the one that you are willing to reach. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the question is more within the multi-objective optimization, it's useful or, or you need some sort of performance indicator, be it um, yeah. you know, a hyper volume or whatnot. Um, yeah. and, and how should you choose that one? And, and there actually, um, yeah, it, it might be useful to actually get input from the domain expert. Like, yeah. well, these types of this, this objective here is, seems to be more important than this one. So and have some sort of preference el elicitation stage, um, have the human in the loop and show initial solutions to the user and say, in which direction should I go more? And then from that sort of elicit performance indicators for the multi-objective optimization, I think that would be actually really useful. Good, good suggestion. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Frank. Very nice, thank you. Yep. Okay, so thank you very much, I think. We can end here this DASI seminar. I want to thank again Frank Hooter for accepting our invitation and for giving this extremely interesting talk. And also thanks to all attendees for the very pertinent questions and conversations. So thank you, Frank. Yeah, thanks again for the invitation and thanks for for the really good questions. And really interesting and uh, thought provoking. Thank you very much, a lot of for, for the talk, and we hope to to keep in touch with you and to discuss in the future as possible collaboration with different people of the of the institute is working different topics and i hope we can discuss any potential collaboration in the in the near future with our our people thank you very much thank you looking forward to that bye